Hello, everyone. I hope everyone is fortified now from this great meal. My name is Teresa, and I'm also part of the local organization committee here. I would like to welcome you to our last session with the topic Heart, Passion and Communication in the Field of Conservation and introduce Mona Konietzny to you. She has graduated in Conservation and Restoration of Paintings at the Academy of Fine Arts in Dresden, 2014. After she worked as a freelancer and a volunteer, she has started here as an assistant at the Paintings Workshop and is now a very appreciated lecturer from us. Now, I give the word to you, Mona. <laughs> Thank you very much, Teresa, for the introductory words. And welcome, everyone, to the third session. And I'm very happy to take on the task of introducing the speaker of this session, Heart, Passion and Communication in the Field of Conservation, that is going to be a very emotional topic, as I, I guess so. <laughs> I am 100% sure that no one of us has chosen this profession for economic reasons. <laughs> Conservation and many other um, disciplines in the cultural sector are known to be less profitable than many other fields. Thus, everyone might have his or her own motivation or driving force to become a conservator, and I guess that passion is most likely involved in this decision. However, there may appear some hindrances or difficulties on the way that could affect and even lower this initial passion. Like, for example, problems in finding a position or conflicts with employers, with clients, or even with colleagues or also uncomfortable working conditions. And salary is just one example that we'd like to pick up here again. But on the other way around, are the expectations of young professionals probably sometimes too high? Or might a demanding attitude even be helpful to improve their own and also the profession's image? I am happy to welcome the three speakers of the session who are going to talk about some of the difficulties we face in the early years, how to approach them, and consequently, how to keep our passion alive. At first, I would like to introduce Anna Galan. Anna Galan is a conservator restorer. She's member of the ECHO Committee and vice president of the Spanish Association of Conservator Restorers. She studied conservation and restoration of paintings in the ESCRBBC, this is the School of Conservation Restoration in Catalonia, with a BA in History of Art from the University of Zaragoza, a Master in Cultural Heritage Management from the University of Barcelona, and a PhD from the University of Seville's Faculty of Fine Arts, and there she specialized in museology, conservation, and cultural heritage. And currently, she works as a collection manager in Musealia Entertainment Company and joined the University of Seville's research group, SOS Heritage. Anna, we are looking forward to hearing from you about your current work, about your experiences, and about the challenges in communication in that field. Thank you very much. I'm very grateful to be here today. Thank you very much. Um, I do would like to share a few thoughts, just a few thoughts, based on my experience. Uh, I would like to say that better take into account the power of communication. I'm trying to divide the, this short speech in three main areas. First of all, what's passion? Second, what's communication? And three, what, which are the areas or context that we must take into account when we work as a conservator restorers? First of all, passion. The meaning of passion for a conservator restorer is love, advocacy, defend of the profession. So conservator restorers are very passionate about our work. We are enthusiasts. We are followers. In most cases, it's a vocational work. We love what we do. We are convinced of the need of conservation, a right approach using the scientific tools, 
and spending the necessary time. For us, it's very clear. So when we speak, we transmit an idea, a message, and we do, we do it using the words we find most appropriate. But, main reflection, whom are we actually addressing? How do you communicate your offerings? So, second issue. I'm going to be very short, but try to be shocked. Communication. I understand that there's three different phases when we communicate. The first one is one-way communication that we inform about our portfolio or portfolio that we uh, share or we send to different companies to show who we are and which are our experience, and also the, the conservation project. So there's one way we, st we send to each other this information. And then the second phase, two-way communication, start the dialogue. They uh, have read it or portfolio and then try to uh, understand when, what, what we should do in this project and why should we uh, uh, dedicate so many time or resources. So we have the three phases. The signing up to an agreement that is a common understanding in the formation of a contract. So as far as I understand communication, we need to divide in three different moments. First, one-way communication. Second, two-way communication, start the dialogue. And three, signing to an agreement. I think that in the most of the cases, uh, these different uh, steps maybe should uh, be in different time moments. And we need to take into account in, in which way we communicate this only information, this dialogue, and how to arrive to an agreement. Because the third step, as I said, is to whom are we uh, dedicate this information? So we have three areas from my point of view, three different contexts. First of all is the work team. So we work with colleagues that they are also conservative restorers regarding to the role or profile using management, management, sorry, management tools. So this is quite important for me because uh, my profile is very transversal. I started studying uh, conservative restoring in paintings. I jumped to the uh, management because I understood that I needed some tools to create schedules, to work with teams, to coordinate these teams, and so on. So my, my tip should be use these management tools because they are there for using, not also for economics, not also for architecture, but for, but, but for us. Second uh, area, communication tool to find a job that is related to the real interaction with the heritage collections owner. So in this case, we need to use marketing tools. We need to know uh, the different targets, the different uh, uh, public to uh, dedicate our, our, our ways of communication. And the third area in communication should be the civil society and the main stakeholders. From my point of view, we should reinforce multiple networks with another heritage professions. We should go to workshops and many roundtables with people that not belong to our profession. And this is uh, um, an important point of view because um, based on my experience, I went to a many conferences, a many congress, uh, only with conservative restorers. We, we talk in the same uh, language, we send the same messages, so it is clear for us. But when we face uh, to communicate or to send a message with uh, another profession, we, we can use the same uh, vocabulary we need to be simple, but try to be convinced. 
And uh, this is why we have to use different languages with colleagues. Of course, uh, we need to know uh, which is our role inside the, the work team. We need to use different tools to find a job to, or to, to work with uh, this company. And the third issue is uh, communicate to the civil society. So we, we need to make an extra effort, effort uh, to, be, um, to, ha to have educational or didactical tools to show always what are we doing, uh, all the process, in the beginning, in the process, and at the end. It is very important that the civil society understand what we are doing and why, why we are uh, dedicating so many time and so many effort in doing this. So uh, this is my, my short speech. I think that patient communication and the context uh, must be there. Um, and thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you very much for the insights into a, yeah, another um, profile, another possible profile of a conservator. We are continuing with Helen Hughes. Helen Hughes studied history of art and architecture at the University College and got her diploma in easel paintings at Gateshead Technical College. After working as a freelancer, she helped to develop standards for architectural paint research in the 1980s and led a wide range of other projects, for example, at Hampton Court and Windsor Castle in the UK. As head of her own company, Historic Interiors Research and Conservation, HIRC, she presents practical options for managing changes in, changes in historic buildings and sharing conservation decisions. Furthermore, she provides workshops and training courses for communities, conservation students, and heritage professionals. Helen, please let us know about your attitude concerning self-confidence confidence and self-knowledge. I must say, um, hello, can you hear me? Yes, I must say I'm delighted to be here and was very honored to be invited by the committee to talk about issues of the heart. Um, so when I was preparing my talk, I thought, oh, I'll, um, I'll have a look at Joachim Pezzalozzi, because I must admit, I know nothing about him, but he sounded very interesting. So I did a quick wi Wikipedia search, and I learned, I assumed he was a 20th century educational theorist, um, but he wasn't. He was born in the late uh, 18th century in Zurich in 1746, and he died in 1827. And interestingly, so he saw teaching as a subject of worth studying in its own right. Uh, and he's a massive influence and very ahead of his time. He advocated a student-centered rather than a teacher-centered approach to teaching, active rather than passive participation in the learning experience, the students having direct experience, and the use of senses and the training of students in observation and judgment. Uh, he stressed the importance of an all-around learning education, um, an education of the head, the heart, and the hands, but which is led by the heart. Um, learning which is cross-curricular, uh, an education that puts an emphasis on how things are taught as well as what is taught, an authority based on love, not fear. So I hope as tutors we are loved by our students and not feared by them. Uh, and also he, the idea of training teachers, the fact that you're very good at something doesn't mean that you're good at teaching it, which is an important term. Um, so I I was very pleased to be invited to help uh, develop a common course in Switzerland here on conservation history and theory. And I think some of you will remember back in 2014, um, we sat out all the tables and the students came in and you could see from their body language, oh gosh, five days of conservation history and theory, how exciting. So they all, they, as many as they all piled to the back there where we put, and I saw they were getting them out and they put their laptops up and they got their mobile phones down there where we couldn't see them sort of thing. Uh, but they had, they had a surprise in store, which I think you'll agree, um, because rather than them sitting and us talking to them, we got them out on the streets. 
We had them looking at modern architecture. We had them on the bus going up to the Alberg. And there we had students from completely dis different disciplines, right close and personal to those wonderful textiles. We were all on the floor looking at the fixing mechanisms. Um, so really sort of getting involved. Um, uh, we set them exercises. We divided them into teams and we gave them an object. And so I think this is a unique selling point of conservators. We can read objects. So they didn't have any documentation to hand. So they looked at the objects. We gave them a, you know, a day to sort of do a little bit of a Wikipedia search. And then the next day, we asked them to do a presentation about their objects, but they had to speak as if they were the object. Oh, and the, the presentations we got, we've got some budding script writers there, great actors. There was one, there was one team, and they had a, a little um, medal, a sports medal. Um, and there were two medals. So they, they considered that the medal had a split personality, and there was a wonderful scenario on a psychiatrist's bench. Uh, thoroughly entertaining. And you know, it was delightful because the passion, um, inventiveness, the eloquence. We had courtroom dramas. You had to argue, should the Sistine Chapel have been cleaned? Had it been damaged? The passion, the, the, the you know, energy that the students had was really, really interesting. Um, uh, and I have devised, and I must say, I, I just steal all these exercises from uh, other people, uh, mainly from ICROM. Um, um, Stefan has been on the several ICROM courses with me, and wonderful exercises. And you know, uh, and at ICROM they always say, never underestimate the power of humour in teaching. And they're always wonderful events. And also uh, the power of and what we're we doing today. This week we've been eating and drinking together. And that's always a good bonding activity as well because it gets to people's personality and their hearts. Um, so at ICROM, uh, this is a wonderful summer school that's run every two years, uh, for conservation teachers. Because I think a lot of us, um, and you'll probably find this, that at some point in your career you'll be there at the bench and then somebody will be placed beside you as an intern, and you'll have had no experience in teaching someone. So you think, hmm, what do I do with this person? You know? So how do you teach people? How do you learn? So that's uh, an interesting concept. Um, and there's lots of ways of teaching. It's not just PowerPoints. There's, you, know, you can take people, give them a direct experience. You can actually tell someone, just go and learn it on YouTube, which is actually quite nice, because you know, if they haven't got it the first time, they can repeat it and do it again. So there's lots of different ways. And if you understand that people learn in different ways, and that you teach in different ways, can be very helpful. So then, having had a look at thinking, oh, well, maybe our teaching methods, you know, are getting, you know, Joe Kim would be proud of us. So then I looked at the checklist that we were offered. Um, how does one communicate with an employer? How does one work in a team? Uh, what are responsibilities of that team? And then self-confidence for the emerging conservator. So I'll get back to that. And you're going to talk about salaries, which would be very interesting. Um, but getting back to how does one communicate with an employer, that sort of saddened me because I thought inherent in that phrase was, an, was a kind of master-servant sort of relationship. How do I talk to my employer? I don't want you to be thinking, how do I talk to an employer? I want you to be thinking, how do I proclaim to the world? Think big. Think beyond your employer. Think your profession. Because right? your employer probably is a different profession. You're your profession. You forward the, your profession as being conservator. Um, uh, a while, about 10 years ago, I was giving a paper at a UK conference. And it was a conference called Working Within the Project Culture. And I think you were probably chairing it. Uh, and my paper was, as others see it. As others see it. Because I think it's important to realize the view that the rest of the world has about conservators. Because if you understand how people perceive us, probably entirely wrongly, I would say, but it's as well to know these misconceptions that are held. Um, so I had my paper. I go to the conference, and uh, it's true. The conference flyer, someone had decided they would um, interview the great and good of the heritage world to say what they thought of conservators. And I'll read a few of the comments. Um, communication is not as it should be. Um, it is a multidisciplinary field, but not a discipline. Conservatives should become more involved with the wider aspects of collection management. Conservatives are addictive, making today's conservator into another willing slave. You know, blah, blah, poor thing. Um, uh, there are not enough conservators, and they're not rewarded for the magnificent work they do. Ah, oh, poor things. Um, <laughs> you know, this is, so this is what people think of us. Um, Conservation as a profession is fragmented, inverted, and lacks a strong voice. 
not us, mate. So anyway, at the conference, I said, OK, this is what people think about us. And if they were going to make a mission statement for us, it might read something like this. Conservatives are a nice, conscientious, pick and mix group, pick and mix group who seem contented with their low wages. Because they are blinkered, introverted, impractical, and often obstructive, they needed to be managed by us. Honestly, it's for the best. So I asked the, I asked the conference, this is ridiculous, can I blow it up? And they said, yes. So we blew that up. And I would say, but keep it in mind. Because the rest of the world isn't aware of all the developments of conservation that have happened in the last 50 years. Have that in mind and preempt anything like that. Um, a lot of our problems, I think, stem from John Ruskin. And he said, do not let us talk of restoration. This thing is a lie from beginning to end. You know? So that lurks in the background there. And also, remember, we are working with other disciplines. And you, as you quite rightly pointed out, we didn't go into conservation for the salaries. And we're working with other disciplines who, like us, probably don't get paid a lot as well. So our disciplinary identity means so much to us that we get very passionate about it. If we were all, you know, if we were all earning three-figure salaries, uh, we didn't like our jobs, but at the weekend we could go out on our yachts and things, we maybe wouldn't be so passionate about But this means a lot to us because we've kind of made sacrifices to be conservatives, but we love it because I, I think it takes over all parts of our brain, and that's why we think, ah, oh, this is for me. Um, so, uh, I was having a conversation with my niece. I love my niece, obviously, and, and she likes me because I'm an aunt. And she was just being newly qualified as an architect. So she was, oh, I'm an architect, I'm a professional. Uh, and we were having, having dinner, and I went with my friend Helen Shinton, who is a very eminent conservator. Anyway, we got talking about projects. And my niece, Emily, said to me, oh, I know what you are going to say, you two. You're conservators. You're going to say no. And I thought, so Helen Shenton, who was headhunted to go to Harvard University and sort out and digitalize all the libraries there, there was absolute chaos. And I thought, right. So I thought, well, you're playing it this way. You're playing the professional card. And obviously, as an architect, you've been told that conservatives are trouble and need managed. So have some strategy up your sleeve when you're in a position like this. So gloves are off, niece, well-loved niece or not. I said, OK, qualified architect, how does English heritage define conservation? You know, you'll be up with this, you know, it's important. She hadn't had a conservation training in her life, and I knew it. Um, and I said, English Herald says, conservation is the management of change. Now, that took her back. Me actually saying the word change, you know, management of change. So, be, you know, just have some tricks up your sleeve. If somebody says, oh, you're a conserva conservator, say, oh, I'm writing an article. It can be lies, you're not writing an article. On the relationships between art historians or curators and the conservators. And what you just said, and they probably said something that they wouldn't dare say in public, but you write it down and say you're going to put it in an article, and you'll see the colour drain from their face. Because bullying only goes on behind closed doors. But be aware of this. <laughs> um, so what else are we going to say? OK, so how does one work as a team? Being positive and proactive, this is the thing, because we, our unique selling point is that we can read objects and the rest of the world can't. So we can study objects and come up with the wonderful surprises that add to the whole and enhance the project. I, I work in historic interiors and I'd come across a photograph of a lovely Victorian interior that had a wonderful stencil ceiling. When I did my research, I realized that the, the ceiling had been covered, but with lining paper. So it hadn't been obliterated with paint, because it's very difficult. To do. But I said to them, it's lining paper. That means nothing to them, but it, to us, we know lining paper is just there with glue. We all know that we can get glue off very gently with hot water. So I could give them that ceiling back. So because of my research, we could get that ceiling back. In another room, we had four, four white doors. I did some analysis. They were mahogany doors. So if you remove the white paint, we could get mahogany doors back. So we can actually, we're not just obstructive, we add to the understanding. Uh, and the exercise we did with the object, it was to understand that objects have a biography and to be able to tell people that biography because it might not, the information might not be there in the documents and the photographs, but the biography, biographical details will be there in the object itself. And we, we're, we're the only people who can unravel that. That's important. Um, right, so who decides the, um, the decision-making process? Now, Chris Capel, he, he's a professor, conservation professor up in Durham University, and he said, we conservators are invariably focused on how and not why we are doing this. 
We stand uncertain and mute as decisions are made. Well, don't put yourself in that position. Get involved. Get involved in the decision-making period. Don't sort of go into sort of little huff in the corner. Yeah, I don't think this should happen. So, so just be involved. We're saying get involved. I mean, Salvador Munas Venus, um, he, in a paper, it was called controversially The Profession That Wasn't gives a quick sort of summary of the history of conservation as a professional. And you can say in the 18th century, a conservator would be um, an artist who would just do the repairs. Then, later on, it was the restorer artist. Um, so this is the time when um, Ruskins kind of say, oh, life and beginning to end. So is, is the restorer a forger? A bit of sort of, you know, this way of thinking is quite difficult. Um, then, in the 1950s, um, the conservation science, so we could say, oh, but we're objective, we've got white coats and science. And this is when the rest of the world is discovering values. Uh, so there's nothing that's objective. Everybody else is getting in subjective decisions. Um, so sort of taking a retreat in conservation science wasn't really a good move. Then the Borough Charter came, and then after that, there's all these charters, and we're talking about intangible heritage, living heritage, the question, questioning the Western view of conservation. Uh, the, the young lady from Cuba was mentioned this, we've got a very Western perspective, perhaps, in this conference. Uh, the importance of spirituality, the importance of objects and community and the relationship. So suddenly it got really interesting to be a conservator, because you've got all of these multi-values, and we have to negotiate our way through all of these. Um, I was at an ICROM, the ICROM conference in Copenhagen. Uh, of course, you weren't there because it was just far too expensive, so, which is sad. Why can't we get students to get there for free? Um, but there was a wonderful opening address given by Kathleen Dardes, who's the head of conservation, uh, the conservation department of the Getty. And she was, um, it was celebrating 50 years of ICOM CC. And what she said was very important, I think, for young conservators. The changes that have occurred in the field over the last 50 years invite consideration of conservation's broadening professional landscape. It's increased engagement with the public. So you who are communicators, you know, you've got a great role there with, you know, drawing people in with the stories you've got to tell. Um, and with its response to climate change. I mean, you know, we're all going to be dead. You're the ones going to have to face this. So, so you know, take responsibility, uh, which have a major impact on the practice of conservation. The profession's younger generation will need to take on these and other challenges with vision and leadership. So it's up to you. I mean, we're all going to retire in the next 10 years, so, you know, it's, it's your world. Uh, but her, her closing remark, which was, I thought was great, she said, so be audacious. The next 50 years belongs to you and your outward-looking profession. So, so take that to heart. Uh, what else were we going to say? We'll we get to the end here. Oh, right, self-confidence. And I said, how can we instill self-confidence? Because you always turn to me and say, oh, it's all right for you to say that. You worked in it for 30 years, but you know, I'm here, I'm new. What am I going to do? So I think the solution to this is to sort of love yourself and don't be afraid to challenge things. Uh, and another paper I gave, as I talk about the three myths of conservation. And sometimes students, when they're new to the discipline, they hang on to kind of tenants for grim death because it's kind of, you know, a certainty. So, you know, you've, you'll have heard these before, one standard. Oh, I just, don't, I don't make value judgments, just one standard. Everything I do is reversible. Um, I just believe everything, minimal intervention. So one standard, it's not. You know, if you have a Rembrandt that's got a minor little scratch, you're going to, ooh, Rembrandt minor little scratch. There can be other paintings falling to bits in the basement. You don't care. So you're exercising a standard, aren't you? Um, uh, reversibility. You know, what, what can you reverse? I mean, even if I lick the dust off a laptop, I can't get it back. I mean, it might be, you know, we, we talk about <laughs> retreatability, but it's physically impossible to get anything completely reversed. Um, so then this brings me to the last one, which is minimal intervention. Now, it's really hard to get people to abandon this one, and we've tried. We've tried. Uh, we had an exercise uh, last time. Uh, we did lots of exercises, and we had to vote with the students. Can we blow up the term minimal intervention? No, they wouldn't let us do it. Um, but on another course, we were asking students to read quite difficult the theoretical essays. And, one of, uh, and what, all we asked them to do was write an A4 sort of general summary, what the article was about, and would you recommend it to a fellow conservation student as being useful to read? And so the one we um, selected on this occasion was Caroline Villa's Post-Minimal Intervention. 
which is an excellent article, a bit dense. Um, and this was a BA student's response. Now, I'm going to read out some chunks of his essay because I thought it was really interesting. This is a BA student. Uh, it says, this article focuses on the myth of the term minimal intervention in modern conservation practice. It was written in response to ongoing tropes of conservation being thought about as an entirely objective process that doesn't subject projects to judgments about whether treatment is in budget, appropriate to the significance of the work, etc. As a, now this is a price to you. As a student, as a conservation student, I found this article and the debate around the issues it discusses to be very eye-opening and helpful to me in understanding the role of the modern conservator. Prior to being introduced to issues like this, I thought it was obvious that the materiality of historic objects should take precedence over everything else, including community benefit, and the job of the conservator was to attempt to ensure the object survived its passage through time as unchanged as possible. I mean, it's, I think this kind of lurks below the subconscious of a lot of people. Then he said, now I'm glad modern conservation has largely moved past this point of view, and I can see that without understanding the value people gain from historic objects, they might as well not exist at all. So minimal intervention, I feel, is a damaging mindset for a conservator to have. Therefore, this article, though a little long and overly focused on paintings, is very relevant for a conservation student like myself today. And I was so heartened when I read this essay. And I thought, he's had a threshold moment, hasn't he? He's had a threshold moment. He's kind of liberated, and his mind has been expanded because he's chosen to say, oh, it's, it's a meaningless, you know, minimal conservation, minimal. I'm not going to use this. So, so, you know, we can sort of, he would blow it up. But just to get back to teaching methods, how do we teach? Now, I like to think that when we teach, we're giving you fishing rods rather than fish. So we're teaching you how to think through and get stuff and you know, get in there and get the fish. So, I mean, I could serve you a fish. I could even cook it for you. I could garnish it with lemon and a bit of parsley. Uh, but I don't want to do that. I want to give you a fishing rod. I want to instruct you how you cast it into the water. I even want to give you a pair of waders because I want you to be there in the stream, turbulent stream, and you're there rushing through. And then you, you're landing a big salmon and you're struggling with the salmon and you get it onto the pebbles and you bang it on the head. You know, I want, that's what I, I, want you, I want you to be strong and assertive in sort of doing this sort of thing. Um, so I'm coming to an end here. So threshold concepts. Uh, and this was came up at uh, the conference at Copenhagen. I, I didn't really know about this idea. And Alison Murray delivered a paper. Um, I'm slightly over. Um, threshold con uh, concept. So first brought into prominence by Mayer and Lang in a paper published in 2003. Uh, Alison Murray attempts to to identify specific thresholds, concepts where the student has difficulty in understanding, and she was applying it to the science curriculum in conservation programs. Now, if we go back to what Maya and Land were saying, it's sometimes when a student's faced with a, a troublesome, uh, often counterintuitive um, issue or idea. But it's almost like when you learn to ride a bike or to swim. You know, once you've launched off on the bike, you're always going to be able to ride a bike. Once you've got the confidence of swimming in the water, you're never, you're never going to have that problem again. So it's these moments, and I think minimal intervention, if you can get over that threshold concept and sort of various others, then it liberates you. It doesn't sort of inhibit you. So what I'd like you to say is, you know, I'd like you all to be, you know, sailing off into the distance with your bike. Um, have confidence. Confidence to let go. And also sort of trust yourself, speak from the heart. Because sometimes if someone's saying, oh, everything I do is reversible, it's gone in one ear and it's come out the mouth and it hasn't gone in the head and it definitely hasn't gone in your heart. So just question things when people, you know, uh, question, why am I wearing these plastic gloves? You know, you know, why? Am I doing it just to make you feel? What's the chemistry behind me wearing these plastic gloves on this occasion? Um, so, <laughs> in conclusion, I want you to be swimming across oceans, facing up to climate change, landing loads of salmon, and, um, and being audacious. Right, thank you very much. Thank you, Helen, for this very inspiring talk and for introducing passion also in the field of teaching, not just the conservation itself. 
I'm stepping over to the next speaker, to our last one for this session and for today. <laughs> and this is Renate Poggendorf, who studied conservation and restoration of paintings at the Academy of Fine Arts in Dresden and has worked at the Bavarian National Museum as well as at the Dörner Institute in Munich. Since 2005, she's a senior conservator restorer at the Neue Pinakothek and Sammlung Schack that, is in, or that are in care of the Donner Institute. She's a member of the executive committee of the German Association of Conservator Restorers, the VDR, and serves as chairwoman of the stakeholders group of restorers and public services. Renate is dedicated to improving the visibility of conservator restorers in public service and to the development of our profession. And we are very curious about what you are having to uh, say on that topic. And we assigned also that very tiresome topic of salary to you. <laughs> so <laughs> thank you in advance. Well, thank you, Mona, for the nice introduction. And thank you uh, again. As the last speaker again, I, I thank uh, the organizing team of this conference um, for, for this wonderful conference, for the organization. And, and I also thank them for having invited me to speak about this very unpopular topic. Um, I, only heard, I was only told when I arrived here that they, they, thought, they themselves thought it's an unpopular topic. And um, I have to admit I was immediately tempted to talk about it. <laughs> And um, probably, Helen, I should have made summer, summer courses at ICRAM to, to, to lecture about this in an amusing way. It's a really, I don't know how you should say that in English, it's a really dry topic, and I, I try to do my very best. Does salary reflect our profession's recognition? This lecture has aspects that would probably better be presented by someone who's at home in social sciences, which I'm definitely not. Oops, I have to find the distance. My thoughts are just based on long years of experience in the field. And although I try to look beyond borders, I can only present my knowledge about the situation in Germany. It would be very interesting to study and compare recognition and the salaries in our field in more countries. The situation may be def very different, and I have to admit when I look at advertisements of of jobs in conservation, I have no idea what that means in that country in comparison to what it means in my country. Um, well, I, of course, I can now only give you this insight into the German situation, but I, I uh, hope I may be able to, to give an idea of the complexity of salary systems, and um, I hope it won't be too depressing. <laughs> But before, we, sorry, before I talk about money, let me start with some thoughts about the recognition of our profession. For us, it is beyond question that professional conservation restoration makes an irreplaceable contribution to the preservation of the world's cultural heritage. Professional conservation means for us we attain substantial mastery of complex skills through academic training, in combination with practical experience on the objects. It means that we provide personal, self-responsible, and professionally independent services in the interest of the general public or of our clients. This is the definition of a liberal profession, in German ein freier Beruf, and we've heard that before. In Germany, liberal professions are, for example, physicians, dentists, lawyers, engineers, architects, journalists, artists. And I think you all agree, these are all professions that receive high recognition. But is what I just described what other, peop other people think about conservation? The general public, employers or clients, politicians, journalists? I doubt it. Still a lot of people think that you must have outstanding artistic skills to be able to restore a painting, or that it needs a good craftsman to restore an object that was once produced by a craftsman. This is definitely some kind of public recognition, but it doesn't match with our own definition of our profession. 
In most countries, our profession is not protected by legislation, not even the professional title conservator or conservator restorer. That means everyone can call themselves conservator, can start a business or luckily be employed by an institution. One doesn't have to prove qualification. In Europe, politics favor permeability between different types and levels of, ed of education and training. They generally favor a free market and therefore dislike restrictions on access to profession. But anyhow, nobody doubts that a physician or a lawyer should only be practicing if he has a degree providing at least fundamental qualification. Why not for conservation? Only the academic degree is protected. The BA, MA, or diploma um, that is awarded by your university and that you are going for or just um, have received. Why is it so difficult to get regulations which define who's qualified and is therefore allowed to make interventions on cultural property? Probably there is still not enough understanding of differences between the various actors in the field. I think conservation restoration is not sufficiently recognized yet. Now let me talk about this, the other key word of my lecture, salary. Salary is, salary is the amount of money that an employee is paid regularly. But as numerous conservators work in private practice, I will make a short note on the remuneration of freelancers as well. In the beginning of this year, the German Conservatives Association has made a survey among its 3,000 members. About 600 of them, or 20%, have returned evaluable answers. I will quote some of the results. 36% of our members say they can finance their living through their work as conservatives in a good or very good way. 44% say finances are satisfying or just sufficient. The rest, 20%, cannot find, finance their lives on doing conservation. But I have to say here that the survey doesn't make clear if these people maybe work part-time or, or if they really don't find work. If conservatives work for other conservatives or some kind of private institution, wages are negotiated individually in Germany. And I can't tell you anything about that. But in our country, most employed conservatives work in the public sectors. According to the survey, these are about one third of the VDR members. And of these, only one third uh, were content with their salary. <laughs> in Germany, in the public sector, salaries are negotiated between representatives of the employer and of the employees, which are the, that representatives are, are the unions. There are different salary agreements, and I have to skip details and simplify quite a lot, although it may still seem a little bit detailed, what I'm telling you. Each position has a ranking on a wage scale with 15 levels. In general, the higher le the level, um, the higher the prof professional qualification, or the other way around. Um, but employees only get a salary on the level of the final degree of their education certificate if their daily work correlates with this degree and the description of their professional task. That makes sense in general. A museum guard that has a PhD in some kind of science is paid as a museum guard. But for conservation, this is a problematic regulation because it splits up our task into, into details, into bits and pieces. In West Germany, and I have, again, to skip something, I have to skip the um, former eastern part of Germany. In West Germany, in 1968, for the first time, the, area of, the areas of professional activity of restorers were defined and were allocated to the different levels of this wage systems, or of these wage systems. That was almost 50 years ago. You can imagine that the description of our profession was very different from how we are supposed to work today. Let me just give some examples from my field, paintings conservation. 
the highest level a paintings restorer can reach, and I say restorer, not conservator, um, on purpose. The highest level a painting restorer can reach is when he executes, for example, to transfer a painting onto a new support. Um, one level below is lining, and I guess both are treatments um, which, well, I'm not paid for that. <laughs> um, Technical examination was regarded as a supporting task for scholarly evaluation. This scholarly evaluation is apparently thought to be done by others because our profession in this old wage system doesn't really exist on the level to which employee, employees with a university degree are generally assigned. Well, for us, it's more than obvious that this ranking system is terribly outdated. But it is still the system valid for about 50% of the conservatives in public services in Germany. Luckily, things are changing. In 2014 and 2017, the labor agreements for conservation were fundamentally renewed for parts of the public sector. Thanks to, and I really have to, to mention this, with um, emphasis, thanks to the knowledgeable and dedicated cooperation of some colleagues, these agreements now represent our present-day profession. They specify, for example, expertise on care of collections or preventive conservation, te technological research, the development of conservation concepts, etc., etc., our profession. Now, also in conservation restoration, a bachelor's or a master's degree is assigned to the appropriate level as any other profession. Experience, higher responsibilities, or exceptional requirements on the job allow for higher levels. These new ad agreements look like a quantum jump for conservation in Germany. But in fact, it's not a jump. It's still a rather troublesome climb up the hill. Because conservatives only reach a certain level if they can prove that more than 50% of their daily work is equivalent to this level, according to the descriptions of the salary agreements. And there's another um, very unfortunate drawback. The majority of the degrees of the last decades are diplomas from universities of applied science. According to a decision of the German government, these diplomas are put on an equal level with a more recent bachelor's degree. Or to compare the qualification with the European qualification from, they are put at uh, European qualification frame level six. Right? Good. Um, but these former studies in conservation took about four years. Counting the formally required internships of up to three years, the professional uh, training took up to seven years. We, the VDR, think they should be regarded as equal to uh, EQ, EQF7. And yet another problem, public institutions have a rather fixed job plan. That means for an open position, they have to find a person that fits to the given level of this open position, not to the qualification really needed. There's still a long way to go to gradually improve these job plans. Easy to understand because this costs a lot of money. At the moment, 80% of the conservatives in the public sector in Germany are paid um, at levels um, um, equivalent to a B VA degree. This has to change. But for the colleagues working for those parts of the public sector that recently got new salary agreements, things are getting better. The first results are promising, and we don't have final results yet. The improvement, improvement looks as it's going to be at least one level, but up to four levels up. And at the moment, we're also hopeful that um, for the rest of Germany, uh, the salary agreements will be ne negotiated soon, finally, after 50 years. Now a short note on the private sector. In Germany, freelancers and conservation are just as well as employees generally not content with their income. 
The fee per hour seems low if you compare it with other professions. Reasons may be a strong competition or the fact that conservation is time consuming and therefore more expensive than the clients may expect. There are many aspects and we may come back to that in the discussion. It needs better recognition of conservation in general and of the specific needs of qualified conservation to improve the situation. Let me come to another little side aspect. It's not, maybe not a little aspect. When I look around, I see mainly women. And of course, I don't have a problem with women in conservation. In many professions, the percentage of women is increasing, but the increase in conservation seems to be higher than in, other, in others. Um, why is it like that? I did dare to draw a personal and definitely not approved conclusion. The interest of young people to study conservation seems to be gen generally decreasing. A reason may be that conservation is not regarded as a profession with a good, with good career opportunities, and you mentioned that before. Young men seem to be easier discouraged by the prospect of bad career chances and low pay than women. Okay, then conservation of the future will be dominated by women. But this might be a vicious circle. Today, professions dominated by women are, according to studies, endangered to lose recognition. This tendency today may change with the increasing professionalization of women in general, general, with increasing number of women in higher positions, etc. It's a general political topic. But we should be aware of it in our field. The question was, does salary reflect our profession's recognition? I'm afraid I have to say yes. The recognition is not good, salary is not good. I think um, we, should, we have to both work on both. This may sound depressing, and I don't want to be depressing, especially not talking to young people. Um, we are managing change. <laughs> um, good luck as the last person you can pick up things. Um, well, it's up to you how the story continues. When I started my professional training, it just came up among German conservatives that professional education on university level must be the future. That was in 1981, and that sounded like science fiction then. And look where we are today. If you think the circumstances of this profession are not yet satisfying, do something to change them. It needs effort, but it's possible. For example, join a conservative association. We've heard that before. IIC, ICOMCC, or, or better, and your national association. But don't, don't only become members, but become active members. It helps yourself and the profession. Conservation is a wonderful profession, not only because of the task we are fulfilling, but for me because it needs head, hands and heart. Thank you. Thank you very much, Renate, for this, yeah, not only this desperate talk, but also <laughs> you giving motivation, and I hope this gives this gives you the possibility of um, generating questions, because I think this is a very great topic to start with, maybe because this was the last point we had in the session too. The salary. Are there already questions from the audience? Not. Maybe we I mean, we have three speakers of different backgrounds, and Anna, what is, what is it in Spain? So what is the position, the recognition, the salary of conservatives in Spain? Do you, are there surveys, like from the German Association? Well, 
in Spain, we are working hard in order to uh, salaries get increased and the recognition of the profession. We have a strong problem with crafts, and uh, we have a problem with uh, the concept of our profession. And we are working in this line. Our association is working with politicians right now and with different uh, governments, different governments inside Spain. Uh, we hope that this should change sooner or later, but, but it's a long way, it's a long way. It seems like uh, this issue should be uh, solved 20 years ago, but we are always talking about the same in our general assemblies. So this is why it's so necessary uh, be part of the association, the professional association, and, and it's right. We need people to be active in this association because we need help to do this. So, relating to the crafts, uh, in Spain has been a, a, an idea to to put another professional uh, regarding not with the, the university degrees less than the university degrees, and we are also fighting with them. It is not a matter of assistance of conservator restoration. Uh, we need to work as a conservator restorer, and we need, we need to learn all the process to be junior, to be senior, and to be able to coordinate and to manage projects. So that's the situation in Spain. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. So it's more or less the same. So we're working on the same issues. We've got a question. Um, my name is Eva from the um, Hakka Bay from the school. And I'm wondering um, if it's not, if the difficulty doesn't also lie in the fact that the world, just to say in an abstract way, doesn't really know what we are learning and what we are doing. Because in a way we are now academ academizing our, um, or we, we, we'll be, we're having a higher uh, status of, of, of um, education, but on the other hand, of course, we are still have we still have that um, the, we are still working with our hands. So we still we, it, it's like we're, we're two things in one, and and the people that we work with they really don't understand what a drop of water can do to materials. So they so this this. Um, this discrepancy between the people that we work with and our knowledge and their knowledge, uh, how, how can that be, how can the link be made that um, it becomes more transparent what we, um, what we learn and who we are? I guess this has been subject also from other conferences in a way, and maybe it's a silly question because how can it be answered, but somehow um, I just wonder. So we, we want to become, we, we, we want more recognition. So many of us are doing PhDs. We want to have also positions that, that decide upon things that where you don't, where you can't restore anymore. But um, yeah, it, the, the whole field, how can we actually represent ourselves? And, and okay, I, I hope I've. Uh, <laughs> yeah. Renata, would you like to answer? I think. Uh, I can't answer the how. I think we have to. We just have to be aware of it, that, that it, there is a need and that we, we have to think, what, what am I doing here? How can I exhibit it? Can I give tours? Can I, can I talk to journalists? Whatever. I have to, we have to make, um, yeah, make it more public, what we are doing. And, and the level of understanding it needs that we are doing it. It's this combination of, I mean, heart is, yes. And when I give a, when I give a tour, the people are always enthusiastic that because they feel the passion that you have. You know, they, that comes directly to the people to, you, to whom you talk. But the combination of of um, that the head that leads the hand is undividable. Um, that's a concept that is not that easy to to explain. But I think you can explain it. Helen, we talked before. Oh, sorry. There is another question. Yes. Rupert Featherstone. I was just going to add to what you were saying. Um, it's more about the perception of conservation in popular culture. Um, in Britain, we have a program called Fake or Fortune. Now, that's not necessarily representative conservation, but conservators get involved. Now, it's very much to do with attribution, trying to see is this a real Rembrandt or not. 
but there is a sense that they're going to the professionals and these are the professionals and they're shown on television. And then recently, um, colleagues of mine working at the Royal Collection were featured in a film of their Venetian exhibition. The conservators featured at the same level as the curators in the film and their research. So although that's more talking about the research academic side of painting techniques possibly, which is only one very small facet of painting conservation, which is only one small facet of conservation, there is this going on in Britain that people are becoming more aware through television. And then we had an re uh, exhibition at the Fitzwilliam on Egyptian coffins where we had a conservator in the exhibition and they were talking to people and that was, you know, visible. So little things are helping, I think. I'm wondering whether that's happening in other countries in Europe. Rupert Featherstone, what's that? Please mention your name. <laughs> Wilson Horry, I think Thanks. the comments we... Sorry, I'm back again. Thank you. The, we, the thing, what we heard just now, I think is co completely the wrong way around. It isn't what our qualifications are or what we know. It is how we contribute to the rest of the society. It is that bit we've heard just about it on television or making objects available. What we've, uh, how we've got there is irrelevant as to what, we're, what we contribute. If we say we deserve a lot of money because we've done seven years, seven years training, we don't deserve anything for having done, suffered seven years training. What we deserve the money for is what we produce with that knowledge and expertise and standards we've developed and the passion and the engagement. All those things are the important thing and we'll get paid on that. Thank you. And I, uh, Sebastian Dobruskin, and I have the echo head on now. I think... Um, I uh, just want to add to your comment um, and, and what you said. You said when you look at the liberal professions like doctors, why are they so popular or why do they earn so much money? Because we need them. And we have to get the public to know that they need us. And then we get a better salary, I'm sure. And I think this is quite a lot of political work, but it's the work of the conservator as well. Thank you very much. I think you made a point because, Helen, we also talked beforehand that, um, that we can generate passion in clients or yeah, in the public while, while just uh, explaining why their object is so precious and so valuable. Yeah, I think when we, <coughs> we go on site or we're talking to a client about their object, it, it's, uh, it's actually quite nice for them to see how excited you are about it because it's quite infectious. Um, I think sometimes it's sort of, you know, it's natural, um, but then sometimes, you know, maybe over egg it slightly because, you know, it's, uh, yeah. it's just to sort of convey, you know, this is really precious. I haven't seen one of these like it in this condition or, you know, but, but also um, work with them because, you know, it might be a chair, um, the legs missing and they want to sit on it and that's really valid or a teapot that's lost its handle and they want to use that teapot. So you have to kind of see what they need and what they want and then talk with them openly and sincerely, you know, not sort of patronizingly. Um, and just sort of, as I think it was Anna was saying, listen to your client and see what they want and then work together, you know, talk to them like they're, they're your best friend. Yeah, exactly, yes. and I think uh, an object becomes um, becomes more valuable to, to the owner when he knows about what he's, he's got there. And yeah, I think it's also with cultural heritage, with our common heritage, we can generate that. If you talk to the owner or the, the body or whoever you know, in charge of it, understand what that means to them. Because sometimes it can be a value that you're unaware of. You know, and take that on board. Yeah. There's a question in the last row. Uh, uh, Piotr Popławski from Academy of Fine Arts in Warsaw. I want to share um, a, felt a story, a point of view about a lot of those uh, topics from the Poland point of view. Uh, first of all, I share a little story about my life and my, experience, my first experience about what public uh, what public um, thinks about conservation uh, when I want to when I want to uh, start my studies of conservation on the, on the Academy of Fine Arts, first I, I needed to be prepared to the exam. 
I didn't know how to draw, how to paint. Uh, my wife taught me how to, but uh, we were hiding because of, from my parents. They do not know that I was going to Academy of Fine Arts. My parents are engineers, and when they heard that I want to be a painter, want to go to the Academy of Fine Arts, so I, I was talking, I want to go to conservation, it's uh, science, it's, it's important, it's, it's also technique things. No, they seem Academy of Fine Arts as painters, so my father, engineer, don't, don't want his son to be a painter, so, and also painters do not have salary goods, so, no, no, no. So that was my first, uh, first, uh, uh, experience with what, pub, uh, what, 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 what is the public point of view about con uh, conservation and um, what's more about now, a point of view about um, conservators and public institutions. It differ from the cons institution in Poland. There is a problem in, uh, for conservators that are working in archives because they are, they are uh, their salary, uh, they, are treated, they are treated like, um, like uh, people from archives. Uh, so they are not treated like conservators. So they have the lowest salary that is in our country. So after six years of studying, sweat, blood, everything, <laughs> and, the lowest that sal and the lowest salary that, that you can even uh, imagine. So, and, and also in the private sector, also point of view, it's a tricky because there are um, private collectors that they want to have something to be conserved, to, to, to be restored, preserved. And some of them, when they heard, for example, okay, I will do it for um, materials, job, everything, 1,000 zloty, they say no, 200 maybe, <laughs> wow. And, uh, and this is one thing, so they, they just want to have the price very low. Uh, and, but there are, there's a tricky thing with the other point of view. There are, um, there are private collectors that when they hear too low browse, uh, price, so they, you will say 1,000 is a lot, and they say, no, my collection is so good. You are, you are so cheap, so you can be a good conservator. Like, wow. <laughs> so, thank you. <laughs> Thank you for that comment. We have another question in the first, in the first row, and over there. Yes. Thank you. Müller Straten. Um, uh, I want to propose that uh, the uh, um, academies. Uh, the universities for applied sciences, they uh, should uh, differ differentiate between public image of conservators and restorers and the public acknowledgement of them. Because the public image of conservators and restorers is excellent. And uh, the public acknowledgement is very bad. And uh, I would uh, like to uh, direct the attention of uh, looking at other um, jobs, at uh, what do they have in common uh, with co uh, conservators and restorers. And uh, the first uh, working group I realize uh, in this context is museum people. The same happens to museum people. Museum people are ill-paid and well-honored uh, in the public. And uh, in most cases, uh, you look at these working groups uh, which are ill-paid, uh, they have one thing in common. And uh, I think this uh, term has been used here in this conference several times. They all have in common that they love their jobs. And uh, with reference to museum people and conservators, one thing uh, adds, and this is uh, they love the objects. They love the art objects. And they love culture. So I would say that uh, any working group who says, 
we love our jobs, we love the things we touch, we are allowed to touch. They are ill-paid. Uh, if you ask a medical doctor or um, a lawyer, for example, he couldn't explain what he is doing in such beautiful words as you are using. He would only say, this is a way of earning much money. Uh, and my father was a doctor too, and uh, I love to help uh, people. But uh, he cannot really explain why he becomes a lawyer or a medical doctor. You can, exp you can explain it very well. But therefore, I would say it, it can be quite useful to identify the groups who are acknowledging your job. Who is it really who says uh, it's only in Germany, TVED, 9 up to 11? Uh, who is it really? Is it the head of the human resources? I would say no. Who is it really who makes the prices? Who is making the ruler? <laughs> and um, therefore, I would say uh, there are some groups in, in the public who uh, are very important for you if you want to change the system. And one of these groups are public journalists in newspapers who always have uh, one sentence uh, with reference to conservation uh, and restoration in mind. I can only use this sentence in uh, German. I can not translate it into English. Uh, this sentence is uh, im neuen Glanz erstrahlen lassen, oder im alten Glanz erstrahlen lassen. This term is used to uh, characterize uh, conservators. And this is exactly not the ideal of uh, conservators and restorers. This is the ideal of 30 or 40 years ago. So what can you do to transfer your uh, actual image to journalists? That would be a very good question. And how can you involve journalists to uh, solve your, pro your, your uh, payment problems. May, may I just try to give a translation of this sentence? Uh, it's, it's in, in, in neuem Glanz erstrahlen means that it shines again in its old gloss. And that's not what we are doing. I can't, I can't give a better translation but to get the rest of you. We hate it because you find it always. <laughs> Yes, absolutely agree. We should be more in contact with the journalists. Uh, we have the case in Spain uh, about Cecilia, maybe you know it, about Ecceomo. Each summer, as the journalists don't have any news, not this summer, <laughs> and other summers, always appear with this, this, uh, this uh, something like an article. Uh, the restorer that most successful in Spain. And it's very painful for the uh, cultural society, for the, for the restorers. And um, on the other hand, they usually go through the um, Prado Museum, for the most important museums, and give idyllic ideas of what a restorer is. So yes, we, we need to work with them. I don't know in uh, how and, and in which sense, but it, it is necessary. And I'm afraid that in our studies, um, a conservator restorers uh, don't have a, a good skills about communication or regarding with this, because we don't dedicate our time to do this. But it's very necessary, I think so, and I, I'm very confident about this. Yeah, thank you very much. We have another question here on this side. Uh, Eleonore from Hakkabe. Uh, I was just wondering if maybe one of the reasons or connections why it's 
a bit more difficult for us to get recognized um, in terms of financial <laughs> uh, salaries. Uh, it's maybe also has to do that a lot of people perceive jobs um, like restoration, which are very passionate jobs, but also cultural oriented jobs, a bit um, as hobby jobs. So you know like how everybody thinks, oh, one day I'm going to write a book. So they always say this to, at parties to their writer friend who actually writes every day and it's really hard work, but they think, oh, I really like going to the museum and maybe one day I would open my own little atelier and also be a restaurator. I mean, I'm kind of making a caricature, but I do think that a lot of people perceive jobs um, that are more on the cultural side and that are very passionate um, they perceive them differently as a doctor. A doctor, you would never say, as a hobby, I would be a doctor. That doesn't make any sense, right? <laughs> so, yeah, I don't know, just a thought. <laughs> Another comment over here. Thank you. Stefan Belischki from Bulgaria, this time with uh, Echo Hat. <laughs> Again, uh, just short comment on the um, low recognition of our profession. And it's not only the need to communicate uh, more extensively with the society, general society, but also with the other relevant professions. And I'm afraid that a lot of these professions just don't understand our own profession, conservation, restoration. If you, it was not by chance the question coming from the architect on the conflicts between architects and conservatory stores in some countries. It's because of misunderstanding of professional principles of conservation restoration from some of the architects and maybe this is one of the reasons of these conflicts. So it means that we also need to communicate better with other professionals, with architects, with archaeologists, with curators, with politicians who are also, many of them are not aware of uh, really of the need of high professional level in order to preserve successfully our cultural heritage. So it's, there are different levels of communication. It's not only the general public, but also other professionals. Thank you for that. We, we got a question of, okay, first you, <laughs> and then I keep you in mind. Uh. Uh, David Cueco, Aguilelia Cueco uh, from France, which my name doesn't show, but uh, I'm ECO, uh, and also I'm the French representative of ECO, FFCR in ECO. Uh, question of recognition uh, of the profession. I've been fighting for 30 years, something like that, for that, and I still don't know where, what could be the better strategy. I think we, we have tested almost all. Uh, for example, uh, being recognized as a liberal profession, putting the intellectual part of the work as the main issue or the main concern to build the profession was a strategy. Didn't work. And, um, well, it does not really work. And uh, because some of the, our, um, the people who are giving us the work were supposed to share, but they are giving us the work, they pay us. Consider we are, some of them consider, because that's their interest, they consider we are hands-on, you know, practical, not thinking. They are the intellectual, we are the practical, you know, hands-on. And I think this shift between both, the balance between both, is something which is totally un not understood. Uh, uh, Really, they, some of the people are thinking we are just doing the job. And we go in that same shift or um, problem between art and craft, you know, very good experience and very good ability or skill of, you know, working with your hands. And on the opposite side, the intellectual, the one who is not able to touch anything. And we are, according, to the people we are changing, we are discussing with, they will be in this, you know, they will put us in, the, in one or the other box. In France we had that, and we have been identified last year, for example, in the category of art and craft. Even if at the same time we, we are recognized with a master's degree to enter any museum for conservation restoration. 
So that's something which is really important. And I think this is not solved. We are not understood for this capacity to be able to work on the object and on the history, on the values, to value the object. And so this is another point, let me check. <laughs> uh, of course, the question of the fees, uh, how much we're paid. Well, it's the same in all the cultural field, most of it. Uh, except the managers will get more money because they distribute the money to the others. But otherwise, we are considered as, you know, uh, lower fees in the society, I think, most of the time. All the creators, of course, they are more important. And then I wanted to just to, to highlight or uh, ask the question. The, the, I, I totally agree about the passion, the, the passion we have. But I feel like it is some, in some way um, disgrading us because as we are passionate, well, we don't need to be paid. We, we, and it, in, in a way, it lowers the responsibility because we are so passionate. And I think that's really something where we have to be very cautious. A doctor will be never considered as passionate. And I'm sure he is. And he will save people. I, I think doctors want to, make, to become a doctor because they, they want to save the world. They want to save people. And so they have good reason to become a doctor. And to become a lawyer, you want better justice in the world. So you do it for it. You have good reason to become these professions. And so what are our reasons? That's maybe the question. Probably to have a better uh, cultural heritage to transmit, to analyze, to discuss. And we tell a story. And that's probably the last point I want to say. Um, we are the one in, in the scheme of all the professions where we are not really uh, mapped. <laughs> an old story. Um, I lost my track, but uh, we... Uh, that, well, that's not uh, okay. We we're telling the story. We that that's something you said when we are in front of the public, when we reach the public, not only with the object, but when we pass in front of the object instead of being always behind the object, never being visible, uh, 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 except when we publish. That's something important to be said. And uh, when we are able to talk with the people, telling the story. The story of the material, how, to, how it was made, the story of the object, how it was transformed, how it was changed, the management of change uh, during the history, and how it's valued now, or it was, and then it has changed. All this, we are the ones able to tell the curators, sharing with the curators the information they have. But I think we have this connection between all facts, and that's where we have a role and an, an important uh, place, and that's probably the most difficult to, to tell and to be recognized. And the last point is, we are responsible. So I would say, oppose the pa if you go to the passion, never forget the responsibility, because it's more important for society than our passion. Our passion is important for us, but our responsibility is important for society. Maybe that's... Exactly. I'm opening a door which is already yeah. open. Thanks a lot for that. And yeah, I think we also have to be aware of how we do our PR for ourselves, because when we guide um, other people who, who are not non-conservators through our studios, we of course show them our practical work. We are not showing them the thousands of hours of research, for example. Yes, but you should not say only the practical work. It's always the, the, the Oh, yeah. sorry. Uh, uh, well, this. Uh, okay. Uh, the the the. Well, sorry, <laughs> missed that. But it's um, what we do practically. Is we can't work practically without being uh, thinking about it. Your hands are not able to do anything without your brain thinking. Um, exactly. We have to show that. And that's yeah, probably what we have to somehow. to show and and explain. Yeah. Sorry. Thank you for that. Could you pass on the microphone over here? Thank you. Thank you. Annika Bilinski from Cologne uh, Institute of uh, Applied Sciences. Um, I don't have a question. I have rather a comment or I want to share personal experience. 
um, about communication with journalists and PR of our jobs and our um, what we do. Um, I must say that I haven't had too much communication with in the first years of my studies. Um, the first time I really um, had um, a conversation or I uh, got to know the view of other people or how other others that are not involved see our profession uh, was when I was um, abroad, actually. And um, I was very positively surprised by how it was because I didn't knew it from Cologne. I haven't learned it. Maybe it was just because I haven't been at the right places. but. Um, I've been in uh, Norway for two weeks for summer school, and I've seen how <clears throat> I'm sorry um, the Norwegians pay a lot of uh, a lot of attention to their PR. Um, and during that project, we were doing a blog, which we were all very annoyed every evening writing down what we've done. But the um, the answer and the um, the outcome of it and what we got back from all of it, it was just amazing. And it was really nice and a very positive experience. And I think that we should not be too shy to show what we can and what we do. And um, yeah, because we can gain a lot of it out of it, I think. Thanks for that. Next question. Thank you. Anya, wearing the hat of uh, ECHO, I just wanted to make, uh, the, take the opportunity to make an announcement. Um, next year will be the European Year of Cultural Heritage with a lot of uh, actions. Um, uh, ECHO has planned to create or to make a call for a European Day of Conservation Restoration. So everybody, all, all, t all players are invited uh, to open their private studios, institutions, um, um, working sites to open to the public. At a, may maybe it's a Sunday, we don't have the, the real uh, day for the moment. And it will be accompanied by um, several weeks before. We don't know how much we could uh, take uh, the, the attention of the people for um, social media, via Twitter the, and via Facebook to, to post uh, pictures, Instagram maybe also, to post the pictures making comments, what about is conservation restoration, what are you doing in the moment, and uh, we, gave, we will give also some um, aspects to, to have um, more ideas like awareness rising, uh, the responsibility of it, uh, scientific work of it. It's just an announcement. It will be next year in October. We try. We will try to, to spread it to have an idea of uh, public relation to the outside, to the, uh, to the society. And meanwhile, we encourage you to follow us in Twitter and in Facebook. <laughs> and regarding with this, I would like to ask you, how many of you have tweeted or something What's happening these days? Really? It, it is not a lot. And may I ask why? It is a matter of connection or you don't have tweet? No, is I don't have tweet Twitter? Yes, I have Twitter. <laughs> I will look for you. <laughs> Next question. I just thought to get um, Eva from from this from the Hakabe. I thought to get back to the recognition of um, because there's a question I think about political lobbying that for some reason conservation restoration doesn't have uh, political lobbying. But um, from what I've understood is that there are institutions that are engaged with cultural heritage that do have political um, lobbying. For example, in German, it's die Denkmalpflege. Um, and I think in English, you call it heritage institutions. Uh, that, And I'm wondering why 
why are they not connected with, with us? Why aren't they lobbying for us? Actually, I think in, in Switzerland, um, I'm, not, I'm really not perfectly informed, but they, some in, of these institutions actually believe that we are only hands-on. So they, they are even contributing to um, a very wrong image. And, and, and I'm wondering how institutions of, in museums that know what we do, how they can contribute, that there is a, a connection between these for political lobbying. Thank you for the comment. Yeah, he has a question. Thank you. Um, Sarah Stani, fourth IIC. Um, just to, get, that's a really interesting question, and it leads me to one of my hobby horses which is to do with the leadership of museums and heritage organizations and how many museums and heritage organizations have conservators or conservation professionals as their directors or chief executives. So my personal view about one of the issues of the status of our profession is that conservation becomes self-limiting because all of our peers and um, mentors rose to the dizzying heights of head of conservation and then didn't break through the car ceiling. Now, it's very nice to have um, Stefan yesterday um, from the Mining Museum. Um, is he still, where, where is he? Yeah, I mean, you know, you are a shining star in the very, very small firmament of concert conservators in um, director's positions. And I, my, my role when I was Historic Properties Director in the National Trust, I mean, the only conservator who's ever got to that position, and that's not the chief executive. Um, so it's, I, 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 the, for me, there is something about even, you know, when you are studying, just thinking about what are those, wh how far can you go in your career? Because as soon as we have conservators in these chief executive positions, it will have a real impact on the status of the profession. And one of the organizations that does lobby government in the UK um, and is directly financed by the Department of Media, Culture and also Sport um, is the National Museum Directors Council, which are the 24 directors of the national museums. And not a single one of them is a conservator. Only two of them, by the way, are female. Um, so there's another interesting um, issue there. Um, but I, I, do, I do think that just thinking about the skills that you need in the soft skills that Anya was talking about this morning, um, which you need when you rise into senior management, is something that you can be learning and practicing right at the beginning of your careers. And I do encourage that as a way forward for the future. Thank you very much. Sorry, sorry. I just wanted to um, com complete uh, this uh, worthwhile comment for your for your question. Why the the preservation department are not lobbying for our con for for us conservator restorers because they know about our qualities and our competences and how necessary we are. It's uh, a, a kind of the truth is uh, that uh, they have also political pressure. Um, because there is another very strong lobby, and these are the crafts, it's arts and crafts, and they have a very strong uh, lobby, and they are really in, in politics inside. So they are afraid of, um, have a preference of one of those related to restoration. They take the restoration as an umbrella term for any works of uh, monuments, if you if you see like this. So if you say, uh, we are the conservatory stores, what, you wanna, you wanna um, 
push out the, the crafts of restoration? Um, it's a question of terminology. So it's always a, a problem that uh, they have the strong lobby there a lot. They, um, since, since years, they have the contacts to the, to the politics, and the politics are um, yeah, giving pressure around, and the preservation departments are also under kind of uh, pressure. It's a very dark uh, picture I'm, I'm painting, but that's part of the truth. You don't, don't forget. So that's why it's important to do this political work as well. Thank you, Anna. I think we have a question from the blog or from Twitter. Yeah, so um, this question actually came in um, um, yeah, half an hour ago, but I still I will mention it now um, from the SAC Saki School, I hope I, oh, in Italy, I hope I pronounce it right. Um, could women have a better sense of conservation in general as they take care of family, house, children? Men are working with technological toys also in our field. Very interesting. Who's willing to answer? <laughs> Who dares to answer? <laughs> Um, when, when, I, when I was in training, I had a, a wonderful, wonderful, um, very famous at the time, um, famous conservator with whom I trained, and, and he was convinced of it. But he also said they're the few men, and they are they are the even better um, well, among the men, many women. But, the, but that was a personal view, and I think it it, it doesn't make sense. It it but it's our self. Um, self-awareness in a, in a way and, and I look at this room and I see at the technical desk I see three students, male students. <laughs> Why? <laughs> I mean we, we are caught in, in these, in these um, well the, 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 the whole gender discussion is a big thing in a conference on its own but um, I don't think that uh, that it, it it must be that there is any difference, and, but I think it has. Uh, um, it is very important to be aware of this um, this hidden information that there is when you speak up as a man or a woman, and and therefore maybe as women we have to speak up more, louder, <laughs> shout <laughs> sometimes, um, and. Um, and it's, I talked about the vicious circle of, of, of the potential of a vicious circle for women in conservation. Uh, it's the same, and that goes back to the, to the question of, of um, the organizations of the care of monuments. Yeah? Um, when you are, I started as a conservator in public services many years ago on a lower level of payment, and slowly, 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 I, I received a higher position. And, and it acts in both ways when you're in a lower position and you have a low payment and everybody knows it. They, if they ask you to, take, to be part of a meeting where a project is discussed, your role is weaker than if you're the head of conservation and you're on the, paid on the same level as the other ones. So with the, with the increase in our incomes, we will become more self-confident. And, and I think to force it, we have to be more self-confident than we are paid to pull it up. <laughs> Thank you. This is an excellent comment on that. Yes, one question again. I totally agree with what you said. Uh, another remark for the question of recognition within an institution, the recognition of the role of the conservator restaurant. I think it's a question of power. That's what you said, more or less. Uh, you have less power. If you have the power on the object to say what should be done, what must be done to save the object, if the object can go for a loan or not, and if you are able to say this object should not move from the museum, you are perceived by curator or a manager with, you know, Bells and organize uh, an exchange of loan or creator. You are the person who block the machine, block the system. And there is a question of power. If you ask for money and if you say, 
there's a very high cost for something you already own, and uh, there's a, a need of uh, an important sum of money when the same money could uh, be dedicated to new, new acquisition. Of course, you, you're putting mess. I mean, you're, uh, and th so there is a question of power. And I do agree that the fact that a lot of women are uh, more involved in the profession. And uh, to be frank, in the committee of FCR, I'm the only guy, the only man. On, on the board, and that, well, that's fun. So I say hi, girls, and well, that's. <laughs> but nobody can complain because it's the truth. And that's if we were going for parity, we, we will have to to ask for more ma men in the, in the field, which it's nonsense. I mean, who cares? That's not the problem. But it's true that the fees are totally lowered and never increasing, probably because the majority of the professions is considered as women, are women. I mean, sorry, it's considered. It's the opposite. So, it's the, so the, the, the payment is, is reduced, is not increasing because of that. I think that's one of the reasons. That's something we mentioned at the Council of Europe. Uh, ECO has some, you ask about some political uh, leverage we try to, to move in, inside ECO. And uh, the Council of Europe, and well, we, we had to develop about, we would have to develop about the strategy on cultural topic at European level. Normally, it's not the competency of Commission, and it's rather the competency of Council of Europe. I'm not going to develop, that's a mess, and that's a pain in, in well. Uh, so, but we are trying to do with that, with the political, the politicians. But, well, politicians, when they want to have an advice, they will go to their technicians, their, tech, their, their, their reference people, and they will be the heads of the institution. So we won't be there. Thank you. Would, you. would you think that there's a correlation between the payment and the amount of women, that women are maybe accepting it more to be paid less? I want to mention this um, about, um, I think it's the medical profession where because there's more women doctors, the status of a doctor is declining because it can be held by a woman. Um, there was a, a paper that Jane Henderson gave at the Liverpool conference uh, and she says it was just sort of an issue that, you know, uh, you know it, it, sometimes mm -hmm. as a woman um, it might be counterintuitive, but actually say the opposite of what you mean. Because sometimes, you know, if you're perceived as an assertive woman, and one time my line manager said one of my problems was I was an assertive woman, like, yes, does rain fall down? I am. Have you got an issue with that? That's just genetically me. But he obviously had, and it was a problem. Um, now Jane Henderson was, ta was talking about this, and she was saying, well, actually, you can do reverse psychology. So if you really want something to happen, and you know this is going to irritate you know, this male boss because there you are being an assertive woman in his face and he doesn't like that. She says, you could try it, you know, just say the opposite. And he might be in such a sort of hissy fit about you know, obstructing you that you might get it through you know, <laughs> counterintuitively. But, um, but that, that is a factor that we all we are aware of and we, we live with. Um, yeah. so I'd say not. Keep your self-respect and be true to your heart, I think. Thank you. Do we have any? Yeah, regarding with this, I think it's not a matter of gender, almost in, in Spain, uh, but it's a matter of a cultural profession. So. Uh, just another point on, sorry. From the block? Yeah, well, actually, um, it's uh, also the Saki, Saki, or the Saki school from uh, Florence, and it is uh, for for the session in the morning. So it's like a total. I would like totally un interrupt it now, so I could like also ask it in the end. Or shall I now? Okay, okay. good. So um, the question was, who pays for fixing students' work before you send away a restored artwork? 
And I think this would be like in the education when a student is doing practical works. Yeah, so uh, there is also a second question, which is uh, for Rupert Featherstone. Um, can American and Canadian students join internships at the Hamilton, Hamilton Care Institute? Yeah. All right. Yes. Yeah. Um, Comments on that? Well, yes. Um, the second question, yes, um, open to anyone who um, is eligible in that they are a recent graduate of a conservation master's program anywhere in the world, and the question being uh, visa restrictions, but we can find ways to accommodate people from the US um, as visiting scholars. So that, that's a simple question. Um, in terms of the first question, I'm not sure quite what they mean by fixing the student's work, but um, it's all a matter of, you know, where do students begin to work on real objects and how and, and, and at what level and at what capacity. You can't hold that moment off for too long. You have to supervise. This is the advantage of having good teacher-student um, ratios and you have to be very aware of what you're asking students to do and, and gauge their progress. There's got to be a lot of feedback to the students um, so that the tutors understand where the students are in terms of their ability. So obviously one wouldn't want to have any um, failures or anything that needed reversing, but if you do need to do more work, it has to be on something like a, a retouching which can be done again, um, certainly not in a cleaning or a structural treatment. So that's possibly, you know, you gauge your supervision uh, in that way. Um, but from our point of view, um, we're unusual in that the staff work on a lot of treatments. So much of what we do is staff-led and students' involvement. As the students gain confidence and ability, they will do more and more on their own. But um, yes, it's, it's, it, you've got to keep, keep a, a very close eye on what goes on. Thank you, Rupert. Any further questions in the audience? Yes, please. Uh, Mark Holly from Cologne, um, maybe just a short story and then a question. Um, in the last years I met a lot of people who study art history and working in museums more or less as curators and they never heard about conservation in their studies. They go through all the years with PhD and they never heard about collection management and conservation. Um, do you think how can conservators change it in the academic system to get more noticeable or to get more awareness and um, how do you see your daily routine in your own institutions? Yes, Helen. There was a paper at um, the ICOM CC uh, about the role of conservators actually informing art historians about how artworks are constructed. And in a way, they were kind of horrified that the art historians had got so far through their career without actually considering you know, how a painting was made and also considering how the image they're looking at might not actually be sort of authentic, that it has been retouched. Uh, and so they were offering courses, you know, showing them um, and giving them little sort of practical exercises that they could make sort of painting and gilding, that they could perhaps understand an x-ray. but. It, it, I think we were all sort of aghast that the art historians could get that far without actually engaging with the physicality of the objects that they're looking at. So, so I think it's, it's just perplexing. Yeah. If I can just add a comment to that, um, it obviously depends during the training of art historians whether they are linked closely to another institution training conservators. And, Many art historians are trained in separate units, but at places like the Courthold, close links, they do joint research projects, they present jointly, you pair up an art historian student with a conservator student, and, and they work together, and that seems to be a very good model. And likewise in Cambridge, we bring the first year bachelor art historians to the institute, at least give them some, a morning of mixing up some paint and looking at technical reconstructions, and we also give lectures, not that many, we'd like to give more, within the context of their, um, of their bachelors. So I think it does depend on university structures, making sure that those links are created really early on. And then you, you've, you've got a much better system and you get art historians and conservators on the same wavelength. Well, exactly, that's what I'm 
conservator because when I started at University College in 76, Professor John White actually employed Libby Sheldon to be a, as a conservator to, to teach us materials and techniques. Uh, and, and there's also, does anyone do want to comment on the, the rise of technical art history? Because I sometimes when I'm talking to an art historian, I'll say, ah, as a non-technical art historian, it might be hard for you to grasp this. <laughs> Because I would say that we are, we are technical art historians, you know, and, and, and you know, we all are, and part of our aspect we, the work we do. Um, so I always think that really we should either embrace this you know, term technical art history, because we are technical art historians, but I can't see how traditional art historians can sort of live with themselves with this other discipline which is called technical art history. I think it's bizarre. It, it, it's sort of like being a policeman, but not engaging with DNA analysis. You know, I just thought art history would evolve into being technical art history, but it clearly it has not. Yeah. Thank you for that comment. Just a remark uh, to mention a publication I've seen in the Geneva Museum of uh, Art uh, I can't remember the name exactly, the, the um, Musée d'Histoire de Genève, I think it is, and where the publication of the collections, they have a conservation studio with five to five permanent people, I think, maybe, maybe even more. And in the publication of collection, they have the art history, you know, uh, article, which is quite consistent with pictures and in front of it, you have the technical report and the article, which is very specific, very well organized, very detailed with, with pictures, raking light, radio reads if possible, and wherever. And it's, it's really a different world. You, it's really a different catalog. It's, it's something you, you, it's a building of knowledge. I mean, that, that's where you get the, the real knowledge on the object. And really, I found it very, very good and well, here in Switzerland, it's good to mention. It's a very good example. I invite you to, to watch this. Uh, I've seen the Northern collections of paintings. I remember the name of the head of the, the, the conservation studio, but he's someone important, I think. Yes, thank you very much. Was there a question? Comment on that. I think yes. I think they are wonderful examples of presenting our profession, and they're just looking at the internet. There's also just the opposite. You find so many museums. When, when I try to find a colleague, some find the telephone number. Who's working there? Who's head of conservation lab? Uh, the the conserva conservation department. You don't even. They are not even mentioned on the homepage of the ref in the in the staff list. So um, this is this is just facets of this this whole thing and and all little things that we can ask for, go for, improve. Thank you. So make ourselves visible in the public. Um, hi, I'm Mariana, Cologne Institute for, of Applied Sciences. Um, I would like to highlight something that I think is very important in our uh, profession right now, and Helen mentioned it as well. And I would like to ask all of you your thoughts about this. Uh, what is the role of sustainability in conservation nowadays, and how should we uh, keep on uh, discovering maybe new green alternatives and yes, just your thoughts about, about this issue. Yeah, this is a new topic. <laughs> that's great. Yeah, that's great. It's a, it's a fact that we are wasting our planet and we should also consider it in conservation. I think we are often not aware how many materials are from non-sustainable sources. Do you already have um, do you have some some examples how to improve for example I'm right now involved in a group called sustainability in conservation it's a yeah, student great. group um, they were also in Copenhagen and uh, presented a poster I think um, uh, we are trying to um, reinforce the, this uh, sustainability thoughts in, uh, already in the conservation institutions. And um, I myself, personally, I'm uh, doing my master thesis in uh, green solvents as an alternative for solvents that we're using 
in our institute, and I think it's a very important issue that I hadn't come through uh, before my master thesis, and I think many of us, uh, or many conservators, don't think about uh, this issue because uh, we have the object there, and we just think what's better for the object without maybe also uh, thinking about the environment. Mm -hmm. You are a Spanish speaker, so I have uh, information for you. <laughs> yeah. Well, I can share with all of you, but it's in Spanish. Okay, so uh, it's just a source. I can you share, I can share, yes. Okay. It's the last uh, publication about preventive conservation, and Benoit de Tapol, that is the uh, conservator of the Museum of Catalonia, have uh, made a lot of uh, and says to, to regard it to this, and I think it could be interesting for you. Thank you. I wanted to, oh, sorry, just wanted to answer for the sustainability. Um, think it larger than just for the environment or green museum, which were some conferences and exhibitions as well. As uh, the sustainability uh, strategy of sustainability in Europe. Um, takes the three pillars of uh, economics, environment, uh, ecological, and social. And in the new strategy, uh, they revise it all, all, all the time. They wanted to put the fourth pillar, culture, but I realized it's not a separated um, pillar. It uh, transfers um, all, all the other, it's, it influences uh, all the other three. Uh, pillars, and so they are revising this kind of sustainability. So if you think about sustainability, it's also about economics. So that's, uh, think large. <laughs> yeah, thank you. One comment over there. Salome from Goa again. Um, I wanted, going back to the topic of how to make more visible our profession, I think it's also important to make artists, art, art students aware of our profession. I was trained first as an artist and um, a lot of the times, especially in modern art, contemporary art, um, artists think they can restore their, their own artwork or museums, if they don't know, if they are not aware of scientific conservation, they go to the artist and they ask the artist to restore the art. And maybe we should uh, try to get more involved in art education, um, I don't know, in the form of conferences or lectures to make them aware of this problem. Uh, but as well, um, I've been to several conferences on on conservation. For example, the the Congress in in LA, the IIC Congress, and they were pointing out that there were no artists present in any panel, so they are not aware of all of this research, maybe. And it 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 also is very helpful for an artist to know how a material that they might be using will degrade in the future, or what is not a good combination of materials, etc. Yeah, thank you. I think it's a great issue. The problem of um, or problem, the issue of uh, artists that are trying to repair or overwork their own works. No further question. I want to pick up um, a point that we ended with last session and we discussed it during, during lunch, and this was the unpaid internships. Um, I mean, we have heard that this is, this is not, um, it's not recommendable to, uh, to start those internships that are not paid. And I was wondering, also as a young conservator, that somehow you have to do internships, and if you are doing them in an institution that is well known, for example, you can put this in your CV, and this will lead you to other positions, maybe, or this, this might be the way that it's worked, and if you are not doing it, maybe someone else is doing it. And I think this is a problem, so there will always be people who are willing to work for free, or for a very, low payment, 
I think this is an issue, this is a great problem. I wanted to ask you about those, those questions. Work for free, uh, are wealthy enough to do that, isn't it? Because <laughs> they're being supported by somebody else. Um, so that's what we're going to say. We're just going to end up with conservatives being sort of rich elite, unless we kind of stamp this out, really. Or by the parents, <laughs> maybe. So this is then another another social issue that rich people get more educated, or then again get in higher positions, can climb up higher and higher, compared to people who are refusing, really re refusing to do great jobs in great museums, because there's not enough money that are, that are, that they are earning. Yeah. The, this system is more or less accepted in, in my country. When you finish your studies, you apply for an internship without being paid, and it is supposed to be the first step to other superior being paid a, a little. Uh, I disagree, but that's, that's what it is. Thank you, but I mean, who's in charge of changing this this situation. The associations, yeah. professional associations, please associate. <laughs> Thank you, Benate. Yeah, I think also it's 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 a matter of it's it's the responsibility first of the institutions and of the the heads of the institutions to say well if somebody contributes to our with work to our institution, there should be money for it and and um, but if if you you can't get it in the institutions, they're always the associations that can kind of at least, at least give recommendations, like a museum association that says, we recommend that museums don't take um, volunteers that are not, or interns that are not paid, but the services that is done, the, the work that is done by people is, is always worth something, and please give that money. And, um, it's a political issue, and, and um, you, you have had the experience when you worked in Munich that um, when, when uh, the, the, the organization of, of or the, the group of interns in the German Museum Association, they became active and said the payment is not good, and they wrote letters to the politicians, and, and, and they changed things. It took not that long, and things have improved locally, and so it's... Um, we are allowed to open our mouth. We are allowed to go to the pollution next in our, in our neighborhood and say, I have a problem. Would you please take care of this problem? And maybe you find somebody. And um, that's the way it worked. That's true. But it needs people like you, Renate. And thank you very much indeed for that, for that support we had of you. Because you were the person, I think, one of the few ones who believed in us and who just guided us the way how to do that in a very diplomatic letter we then sent to the ministry. Yeah, that, but that brings me back to the, the point that I made. Um, if, you, if you as young people kind of start being politically active in whatever field, whether it's you're interested now to say, well, sustainability should be a, a higher issue or payment, then go for it. And um, when I started in conservation many years ago, I did it because I wanted to come sit in a small room and work on a wonderful object. I didn't see myself sitting in front of an audience. And, and, uh, but then I, there was the passion that made me, well, go, go further and further and further. And doing that, you learn how to do it. And you learn that, okay, a letter to a politician or to my director has to have a certain form. So, um, and having that experience, I can help younger ones um, bringing the letter to a certain, who, who, who's, who's, who are the, person, the, the people who I have to address to? Um, but you have to start. You have to start doing it and you'll you get, I learned a lot from just being active also in, in our conserva conservators association. Um, being in a good group, being so, that is supportive and I mean, have, doing that, that work in the association, I've learned so much. I, I sat on a Sunday afternoon writing some, 
passionate letter about something um, that we should send out. And on Monday morning, after I had mailed it to my to to the board, uh, I got received all the very naughty. You can't do that. You can't write that. Okay, I learned from that. <laughs> Don't do it. We have to do, go other ways. Um, but you make try it. Try it. Go your way. And, yes. and you were saying that, oh, if I don't take this unpaid internship, somebody else will. Well, as a community of conservation students, just have it that anyone who takes a, an unpaid internship is really frowned on. Because if you're trying to make a, 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 an appeal to government that the funding for internship should be supplied, uh, nobody should go and take an unpaid internship. That should just be something that a conservation student should not do because it's kind of letting everybody else down. So it's like, no, nobody takes an unpaid internship from now, you know. So, yeah. If that works, mm. that would be great. Yeah. <laughs> that would be great. There's a question. So we're all going to vote, nobody takes an unpaid internship, right? Exactly. <laughs> we all agreed. We yeah. don't yeah. want to see you. <laughs> question? Charlotte Hepka from Munich. Um, I just wanted to point out something to keep in mind. Um, I am a postgraduate intern and I get paid um, a little bit more than the minimum wage but I just have been to a conference for postgraduate interns in Bavaria and um, there are still many interns who are not paid the minimum wage and the reason is um, that the postgraduate internships are declared as um, educational programs and because of that, they don't fall under the regulations for um, payment to get the minimum paid. So um, maybe it's an um, issue of how we name it or declare those postgraduate internships, that there may be not internships or something like that, because um, this is a real... Um, issue because of the legal things. Yes, <laughs> okay. thank you. Just a policy. You're sort of saying we should get the press involved in this. So why don't people who are working under these kind of shady contracts write slave on their forehead in the morning, go into the museum, also tell the local press that they're going to have slave written on their forehead uh, and so they can be photographed going in and, and see how the, um, the directors of the museums sort of react to that, you know. Thank you for that. <laughs> Are there any other comments or questions on that? No questions about the payment <laughs> that is not there. <laughs> OK. Um, yeah. All right. Then I just want to pick up one point um, you mentioned. Um, just have a look in my notes. <laughs> um, yeah, it's about, I think it, it was part of all of your talks. It, it's about that, especially of yours, Helen, that we are making like measures that are, that should be minimalistic, that should have one standard, and that should be reversible. And that I think all of us are just failing this. And how do you deal with this failure? If you, I mean, if you're, we are trying to communicate those standards as our, yeah, it's our basis, so to say, but we cannot reach them. Do, do we communicate that? Do, do we should make this public or? I don't understand, because I, I mean, I was trying to say that, to say, you know, we are adhering to one standard reversibility and minimal intervention. I'm just saying they're, they're, they're lies. And as long as we can just bury them, life will be better. But if you're hanging on to this myth and this lie, you're going to be slightly conflicted between what you really believe in your heart and what's coming out of your mouth. You know? okay, so I'm just going change for... Attitude, yes, just change attitude. Yes, just say what you believe. That's what I'm trying to, to free people so, up. But I can understand when you're new to a discipline, you do hang on to sort of these sort of outdated, outdated mantra because they're kind of a support. But the sooner you can abandon them, see them what, for what they are, then you, you'll evolve quicker and you'll sort of be a, you know, a stronger conservator, I think.
Yeah, one comment. I don't, I don't agree in that uh, concept of minimal intervention is, it may be not, not a general concept, but from case to case it may be the concept, and although I may it's, it's see that I don't reach it, I, I can define it as a concept, that is an ideal, as, as the direction my work is oriented. It's not for... Right for it to achieve what? Yes. Minimal within the context of that project. What, what I, what I, um, I, I see, it, it depends on the project and, and we have to also be, um, to be, to be self-confident to, to say, well, I restore this painting. Yes, I do in painting. No, I can't only stay uh, in the area of the fills if I want this Rembrandt to be appreciated as a Rembrandt. Uh, be open about it, yeah? Then be open about it and say yes, but, but, um, I do it in a technical way that, that I try to reduce the risk for if someone has to take my in painting down again, or that very touching is down. I, I try to go into that direction, be open about it, yeah? And, 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 uh, and uh, whatever um, the world does is not without impact somehow. Our work has impact. And I think um, the, the concepts um, that we were trained maybe in the last decades, these concepts are, are good, good directions, but in a way they were, have become dangerous because for the um, rising um, level of training, for the head, higher education in, that conservation has achieved, that we are thought by some people of not being hands-on conservator restorers anymore. That's one corner they want to put, put us into. Um, yeah, do, do the analysis, do the research, do the concepts, but other people are going to do the practical work. And uh, you, you mentioned uh, problems with craft. We have similar problems in Germany there. Um, craft needs good recognition and what's one's work. And, and um, uh, we have to, to find out who does what. And we are not the ones who do not the hands-on work. And we do restoration and only not only preventive conservation and not touch anything, yeah? Yes, there, there are um, some working fields that are the same, so we are almost working with craftsmen on the same, on the same yeah, objects and also on the same measures. How to, how to deal with those craftsmen? I mean, as young conservators, how to, how to separate us from them, how to, how to split up in that, from that field, how to, yeah, thank you. There's a question over here. And, uh, Stefan Belischke again. It's, uh, we, we have to define the roles of different players in, in, in our field, which are, not very, which are not very clear at the moment, I think. I'm afraid it's uh, really vague, the perception of our profession amongst other professionals in the field, again, coming to, to the different player. And it's really important uh, for, 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 for the politicians, for the managers in the field of cultural heritage, to identify clearly the role of our profession, just to state what is conservation restoration, who is responsible for this, what is the role of the professional in, in this big process of conservation, which includes, of course, other professions, like craftspeople, of course. You cannot avoid that, but we really need to define the role of different professionals. Thank you. Wilson, just later. Uh, David Quicker again. Uh, just on the edge of that, I agree with that, the role of everybody, and maybe look at the standard, which define different uh, sub-activities. For example, if you go for conservation, remedial, and, and uh, preventive and restoration, maybe some of the, the, this division, which is quite artificial, is also a way to identify the more intellectual and maybe the more practical, the more experienced uh, required uh, uh, work. I would send another stone, but it's, I think it's, it's related to this topic. Another stone in your gardens. Um, 
or, or, or a flower, not a stone, a flower. Um, do, do you, uh, are you being paid, it's, it's a question to the audience, are you being paid for an estimate? When you evaluate the object, you make a diagnosis and you propose a treatment. I'm a freelance conservator. So uh, I know what it means, and you know, competition between colleagues and public tendering. But, uh, so I, I don't develop, I can develop later, but when you assess the object, you assess its condition, and you identify, you diagnose the, the, the alteration, why they are there, and what could be done to cure, remedial, and, and, and conserve, and maybe restore the damages or whatever. Uh, are you being paid? Do you consider this as a professional act? I'd say it would depend on the scale of the project. Because yes. if it's a very... I was asked to, um, to tender for the paint research on the all of Auckland Castle, which is like half the size of Hampton Court. So it was going to be quite a big project. So I actually said... It's going to, I actually costed how long it would take me to evaluate and produce it, and they paid me. But if it was a smaller job, I probably wouldn't. Yeah, but do you realize that it's a way of reducing our uh, possible, possible recognition? When you assess the object, even if it's a, a, a stamp, I mean a small piece, a small painting or a large one, of course for a, b a bigger room like this, people will think, oh, he needs time to do it. Or she needs time to do it, she needs time to, and there's a big surface. But if you go for a small work, and you may have time to, to think about it, to propose, to propose different proposal, minimal intervention, uh, a little more, maybe a maximum intervention. You could, uh, I think that when I was a student, that was something I was told. You may always be able to propose three different yes, levels of treatment. Yeah. Of options, course, yeah. it's a minimum. Yeah. And I think that's a very good exercise, first as a student and even as a professional. And it goes in the, the garden, that's where I was thinking of stone in the garden, minimal intervention, reversibility or not, uh, and so. And that's the very beginning, that's, the, that's totally professional. I mean, well, if you're not experienced, if you don't have the knowledge, you're not able well, to do it. I think Rupert mentioned this when you were talking about the UK accreditation system, where when the conservators are going up for accreditation, and you, um, the assessors will expect them to be in reflective. To, to sort of say, well, were there other treatment options for this project? And they all say, yes, we had some other options, but you know, the client did this, or the budget, or the time. So, um, so we do expect conservators to sort of have that reflection on what they're doing and, and look at other objectives and options. Yes, but yeah. then why not being paid for it? I mean, do you go to a doctor to see three different doctors and say, okay, I'm going to pay this one because I like the way he told me. And the other one, I won't pay them because I don't like what they said. And that's exactly what we do when we are not paid for estimation and assessing an object. That, that's what I say. Uh, I'm so sorry, yeah. Peggy uh, never, never No, and you might have a solution for this because you're very practical-minded. <laughs> <Yes. laughs> not a solution. <laughs> But maybe a differentiation. Uh, an estimate, if you say a cost estimate, of course I'm not paid to make a cost estimate. Um, to make a concept with the assessment, I'm paid. It's, I make the, the estimate, <laughs> the cost estimate, how much will, will cost if I make a concept. That's uh, my freelance daily life. Can't you make a cost assessment without the concept assessment? I mean, it's impossible. I know. Uh, you, you mean you mean I describe I, I describe um, the the uh, I, I'm describing the tender the what what you have to do if I have to describe the tender I'm I'm paid as a consultant to make the description of the of the tender and depending how much hours I'm uh, I'm, I'm paid to to make the concept for the tender and also I can make a um, um, an estimate for a tender. It's uh, it's just the, the the work I'm doing. It's a uh, immaterial work. But if uh, I'm a consultant, and I'm, I mean, it's it's um, build, building building conservation might be a little bit different. But uh, I'm just not passing a, a 
by th by the way and saying I know what to do and how much and um, uh, I will I will do the intervention. No, it's uh, it's very strict with uh, a lot of contracts in many steps. So that could be a difference with the craftsman. I think the way you justify what you want yeah, to, to you. do, what you may do, what you could do. And I think that would be a difference because that's the intellectual part. That's where your knowledge is visible and the different options you can have. Yeah, thank you. And is it still, is it still an, an issue in, for, for young conservators? Uh, it will be more and more because more and more. Uh, I don't know in, in how it goes in your country, in, 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 in your different countries. I know that in France almost all conservation restoration is going through public tendering. And then maybe sometime there will be a consultant um, uh, um, among of the, of the, amongst the, the, the tendering itself. So you will have a dossier with all the you know, mm -hmm. diagnosis and, and you will follow it. But I think even when you follow some advice already done by someone, first you lose the possibility of dialogue with the owner or, or the, the custodian. So that's really something missing first. Mm -hmm. And the second part is you will do your own diagnosis anyway, whatever. Maybe if you approve, you totally approve what has been said by your colleague which you never know, generally, you don't know who it was. And uh, so I think you have, when you make an estimate, even for public tendering, which says you will never be paid for that, because in public tendering it's not paid, mm -hmm. except if it is considered as a, a concourse, in French, it's concourse, competition, uh, and uh, then there's, there are some possibilities for higher, uh, for architecture, for example. Uh, uh, the, the, the team can be paid, but for conservation, it's never considered as, you know, necessary. And they, you're chosen because of your project in the end. So they choose a project, and that's why you're paid. But if it is just a proposal, a cost estimate, and a project. I mean, you can't. Sometimes you you see what is in the report, and what is asked, and what is required. And you say, "Bull, uh, no, I'm not going to do that. I mean, that's not what I think is good for this object." And then you redo the stuff. But then, if you answer the public tendering, you're out of the nails, how they say. I mean, well, well I don't know, but this is a topic. <laughs> Yeah, I, I would, I, to summarize this in a, in a way, yes, we should be paid if there's a certain amount of effort in, in something, in, in whatever we do, and, and um, if there is, our conservatives like, like in a public institution that may be, as consultants there, they should defend their co colleagues in, 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 uh, that are freelanced conservatives, and, and I don't know the situation in other countries, and, but, but if, it's, if that is a problem, that's, then we have to, to organize ourselves. Then we have to, to say, yes, what, what does the French Association of Conservatives do for it? Write a statement and say it should be like that. Go for it. I can improve slowly. Um, Peter de Grof from Belgium, textile conservator. Um, in Belgium, it is like that. If it's a uh, uh, if you are asked to, to as a consult consultant to um, make a proposition for a treatment for an object, um, you are paid for that. But um, there is one exclusion, you can't do the job. It's somebody else that has to do it. Yeah. So, yes. so you are paid to make a proposition of treatment and a, and a, a state of the object and all that. But mm -hmm. then you can't, and you can't do the job anymore. But okay, that's for for the reason of competition because you have better knowledge of of um, of that. Um, should you, the one who's who's taking part in the competition shouldn't be have, have a higher knowledge than the other ones. Um, that makes sense. The next time another one will make the the concept and and you will be off make, giving an offer. Um, that's that, that's all fine if it's if it's organized like that. Um, but would we? Yeah, I don't know. I don't really know what to say. It's, it's like that. It's also the, the whole cultural heritage um, environment, I think, in Belgium and everywhere, is getting more and more commercial. 
And so um, sponsoring is involved in that and then a lot of the times it's also the, the sponsoring company or the private owner who um, also wants to decide on how it's going to be treated and that's something really, really dangerous where you have to try to stay out and, and that's why they ask for um, external consultants for big jobs. Thank you very much. Yeah, staying up is a, is a good point. I think that we have time for one last comment or question. Just before, just before David hijacked the discussion on, on defining professions, um, it's been interesting watching what's happening in Britain in the medical profession where we have nurses and doctors and these had really clear definitions between nurses um, and they looked after the patients they, and the doctors did all the medical stuff. So, there's now a, uh, a, a huge gray area. There's almost no distinction. There's very few distinctions between a nurse practitioner and a nurse uh, trainee into moving into the doctor's field. So the idea that you define a, def a pref profession now, and what is it, since 1966, it hasn't changed. These professions are shift all the time. And the idea that we want to define it now and have that definition next year, never mind in 10 years' time, to be the same as now, I think it, it puts us into a box from which we are trying to escape every year. We are all of us, trying, you can hear all the discussion, trying to escape from the box that someone else has made for us. We shouldn't make the box for ourselves. Great. I think there was a very last question over there. Who was it? Yeah. Müller Straten again. I I uh, think uh, that any member of uh, a conservation restoration association can do something to better the situation, because you can urge your associations. Uh, to have someone in charge or on duty for public relations. I don't know exactly if the uh, Österreichische Restaurationverband or SKR has someone really in charge for public relations. The uh, German uh, VDR has, I think, uh, two people in charge for public relations. Uh, but uh, I don't know exactly uh, if they are influencing what we have called here the public. Uh, anyway, uh, you could uh, urge your associations to install such, an, uh, such a person in duty or in charge for public relations, and you can tell them don't understand the public as a unity. Uh, approach the public only in certain groups. We have heard here about art historians. Uh, they are such a group. We have heard here about artists. They are such a group. And I mentioned the journalist. Uh, so uh, there are, of course, there are other groups which are important for conservators or restorers. But they should be approached only in their language, uh, in uh, their dimensions of thinking, and uh, uh, we, sh we should not think that uh, the public itself would, would transform uh, in, into uh, directions uh, which would fit to the goals to, of conservators, of restorers. We have to bring them on the right way. And um, uh, therefore, we need um, uh, someone who really uh, is able to speak in the language of the uh, different groups of the public and approaches them uh, properly. Uh, I don't see, in the moment, I don't see any action in, into this direction. Uh, and I, I see, uh, even if we have, Lots of um, um, newspapers, not of lots of interesting websites, lots of social media. I don't see any 
public relation work for conservators, restorers, and uh, therefore I would say this is the first step. If you have, uh, don't have, uh, if you don't have a union which does it for you, it's first step that your associations do the job they are made for. And uh, I think uh, that uh, these associations are a little bit too sleepy. Thank you very much. Yeah, again, a call to join the associations. Um, yes, a call to join the association. And yes, uh, the German Conservatives Association is quite good and has comparatively many people working for it. Yeah. And it's, it's always, a, I, I was uh, responsible for finances there. It's at the limit of what we can do with um, employed work power. Um, taking that the income of an association is only what uh, the fees of the members put together, bring together. Um, having worked and still working for many years um, for an association in my free time, I'm, and, and also saying here, join the association, go to your association, um, it's, it's really a matter of my at my heart to say an association is not like a huge insurance company that does it for you. We are the associations. And um, some are at a part of their life where they say, okay, I will spend some extra time of my life to, to volunteer, to work for the association, but it's all of us. So um, when we talk about communication, yes, we have someone who, who's, who's a professional journalist and um, tries to do that, but she can't do it for 3,000 people. It's, it's, um, the, it, it must be the, the, the concept of it, the, the task to communicate what conservation restoration means today to us is a matter of everybody. It has to, the, the association can multiply kind of the, the information, but it's, it's, all, it's, all, it's a task of us, all of us. Thank you very much. I take that as the famous last words. <laughs> Thank you, indeed, to all the speakers. Thanks a lot. <laughs>
for session two, Sarah Staniforth, Rupert Featherston, and Anja Romanowski. <laughs> And for our last session, Mona Konietzny, Anna Galan, Helen Hughes, and Renate Poggendorf. Thank you a lot, everybody. Last but not least, Graham, please step forward to us. very calorific conference, isn't it? Cakes, this. Head, hands, and heart. So we've had three topics. And most IIC conferences have a two-part title. So this is, this is our first with three parts in the title. So thank you for that. It's also, it's also our first event in Switzerland, and hopefully not our last. And what a fabulous event it has been. So thank you, everybody. The rule of three. I studied landscape architecture, and one of the many rules in landscaping and landscape gardening is the rule of three. You plant things in three, groups of three, it grows, it develops. And, <laughs> and so on a theme of three, I'd like to do three things. The first thing is for me from IIC to record our thanks. Firstly, to HKB for providing us with this superb venue and the facilities and allowing us to see the work of the students and the academics, which is a rare, always a rare thing to see things on the inside. Secondly, to Stefan, Sebastian, Felix and Mona for supporting this event and guiding the students as well as letting them plan this and implement it themselves. And that, as, 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 as Stefan said, is important. Do it, learn by doing. The third thing is to thank the students on the local organizing committee under the quite inspirational leadership of Issa, who's sitting over here, and who've put together a fully professional event. From registration to the AV, all the technical guys, all the web people, <laughs> it's... It's a, it is a mini version of what we have done in Los Angeles. It's a mini version of what we will continue to do. Um, so thank you. And thank you for the cakes. <laughs> More calories. The second thing to do is to thank our sponsors, of course. And I can quote them here. We have, of course, HKB, our main sponsors, without whom we could not have done this. Abeg Stiftung the Swiss Association for Conservation and Restoration, Truview, Kulturesque, Museum Actuel, uh, Fontana and Fontana, Echo, Defner and Johan, Willard, Kramer, GNW, Routledge, Peker, Lasco, and also thank you to Angela for designing the logo, which uh, has got a lot, caused a lot of discussion, but has been <laughs> the image of what we've been doing, so thank you. And finally, to the future. I think as Sarah mentions, we have interest in a student conference in this series in 2019 in Delaware, in New England. And there may be others of you too who'd like to organize events, 
since I wrote these notes, I've spoken to somebody about possibly an event in Cuba, about possibly an event in Latvia, Lithuania, Estonia. That's exactly what this is about. And I think, as Renata said, it's up to you how the story continues. We have a conference in 2018 in Turin, conservation, the state of the art, two, not three. That is next year. In 2019, we may be having another student conference. It might be in Cuba, it might be in the Baltic States, it may be in America. But what about now? What about next week? What about when you go home? Because we want to capture the energy of these two days and tomorrow in what happens next week. So we have an IIC Facebook site. Contribute to that. We have an IIC LinkedIn group. Be part of that. It's free. We have a Twitter feed. You can feed into that. You can send us articles to put into News in Conservation. If you have ideas and thoughts, send them into us at IIC because we want to hear what's happening now. These conferences came out of somebody coming to me after our 2010 conference and said, what's next? And I said, oh, thank goodness, we've got two years off. There's another one in Vienna. And he said, but what's happening next? Why not a student conference? Why not something different? And that's why we're here now, because somebody sitting where you're sitting said, let's do something. So as you said, it's your story. Now I'll write the next sentence. But anyway, thank you to everybody. It's been a great two days, and enjoy the rest of this evening. Thank you, Graham. Thank you so much for this wonderful conference. I really have to say that all the work I mentioned yesterday in the opening remark was totally worth it. Dear participants, really thank you so much for coming to Bern, to the super expensive Switzerland. It is a pleasure to have all of you here at the Bern University of the Arts. I would like to thank the whole Department of Conservation Restoration and especially Stefan Wilfert for believing in us and giving us a chance to host this event, event and to support us in any way. Further, I would like to thank the IIC coordinators, Graham, Joe and Mikkel for all the support you have given us in the last month. It was amazing how you led us through the organization. And last but not least, a huge, huge thank you goes to all the volunteer helpers behind the scenes that you don't see but who are working all the time, and to the house staff. I would now like to ask everybody, I don't know if better to the front or outside for a group picture. <laughs>